Welcome back, folks, to another action-packed episode of the Caterpillar D2 Diesel Engine Fun Time Hour. In the last episode, we cleaned and installed the new old stock main bearing shells into the replacement engine block for 1113. Since then, I have put 1113's original crankshaft through a thorough cleaning process, a uh, polishing process on all the journals, and performed a pretty thorough inspection on it. And I'm not going to lie to you guys, some of the journals did suffer a little bit of etching from that water that was sitting in there. But all things considered, you know, thinking back to when we took 1113's original engine apart, we drained over three gallons of water out of that crankcase before a drop of oil come out. <laughs> After all that, I'm pretty impressed with how this crankshaft ended up cleaning up. If you're wondering what these props are that I have sticking out of the crankshaft, uh, they're from the final phase of the cleaning that I did to that. I'll explain why they're there. So, when oil is pressure fed into the main bearings through these hollow locating dowels, not only does that oil lubricate the bearing, but it also finds its way into these drilling passages that are in the crankshaft. These passages then carry oil under pressure out to the connecting rod bearings. So you need to make sure these passages are very, very, very clean. First thing I'll do is take a bore brush with some solvent or break and parts cleaner or what have you and run that brush through those passages. Loosens up the worst of the crud and the deposits. The final cleaning, I will use a gun cleaning rod with a white cloth patch. When the patch can be ran through all those passages and still come out clean, you are good to go. So you definitely want to make sure to get all those holes, all those passages cleaned out because anything that's still in there is going to be pressure fed right into your bearings on initial startup and that's going to be a very, very bad thing. So, number one main journal has this passage that feeds down into number one rod journal and then number three main has this passage which branches up to number two and out to number three rod journals and then the rear main right down here has this passage which pressure feeds number four rod journal. Pretty simple setup, just make sure you get it all really, really clean. And one final talking point before we actually do something, we're going back into the spec book real quick. I know some people love this stuff, some people hate it, but it's a necessary evil that tells you everything you absolutely need to know when you're putting an engine together. So, 1113 crankshaft journal measurements. I have mains here, rods here. So we'll look at crankshaft in the spec book. Main journal diameter 2.749, 2.750. Boom, right there. That's your new. And the mains are all really, really good. Number one is 2.749 round. I'm calling that brand new yet. Two, three, and four are 2.748. So they're one one thousandths war, but they are round. Number five is 2.748 to 2.749. We're about one one thousandths war, one one thousandths out of round. So maximum permissible out of roundness on all these journals is six thousandths. Maximum permissible journal wear is seven. In 2019, that's brand new. So we go over to the rods. Connecting rod journal diameter 2.624 to 2.625. New spec, I got it written right there. Uh, we got a little bit more wear on the rod journals. That's to be expected. Rod journals always wear worse than the mains. Um, number one, I had a 2.622 to 2.624, so we're we're going to call it 3,000th worn, 2,000th out around. Still well within our 6 and 7 maximum allowable specs. So, so number two is uh, basically the same as number three. They're both 2.623 to 6.24. So we got about 2,000th wear and 1,000th one out around in both of those. And number four is basically like number one, 2.622 to 2.4, 3,000 square, 2,000 out around. Again, max permissible out around is six, max permissible journal wear seven. Long story short, that crankshaft does not bother me at all. It's getting put in, it's getting run just like it is. Um, all I have to do is my part, which is to keep a sufficient amount of clean quality oil in that engine, and it pretty much doesn't matter how many hours I put on that for the rest of my life, I'm not wiping four more thousands off those journals. It's just, it's never going to get that bad. So happy with how all that looks. And again, <laughs> for all the water we took out of that crankcase, I'm, I'm really, really happy with how that crank is. So now we test the fit up. We're going to see how much this crankshaft likes being in its new home. Long story short, in the next 10 minutes, I'll either end up really happy or really, really frustrated. 
So I've just set the main bearing caps onto the studs, no fasteners on them yet, but I want to uh, take a moment to explain real quick before I put the rearmost main cap on why the D3400 diesel engine has no rear crankshaft oil seal to keep the oil in. I briefly mentioned that in the last video. I said it'd make more sense when the crankshaft was in front of us. Hopefully it's about to make more sense right now. So this rear main bearing is the widest of the bunch and we have our locating dowel right there, but we also have this other hole here that feeds to that hole on the back side. Well, the purpose of that is uh, oil drain like a return passage. So when this uh, crankshaft is spinning, you can see we have this oil scroll. It's basically a spiral that's machined into the crankshaft back here. It's aft of the bearing surface. So that oil scroll portion here will be above this portion of the rear main. It does not directly bear upon it, but it does run in close proximity to it. So when the engine, is turning, running, you have that oil scroll is constantly pulling oil forward and pumping it into this groove right here where it can run through that hole out the, uh, the base of the cap and return down to the uh, sump, basically the oil pan. So that's why a D3400 needs no rear main seal. You have that scroll that can pull oil back in. That's all well and good and actually works pretty well until your bearing clearance starts getting excessive. That scroll runs too far away from the bearing surface and that oil can just pass right on through. Now before I even snug the nuts for this center main cap, I need to make sure that I have my thrust faces of the thrust bearing centered with one another from the cap to the block. Um, this cap can migrate, it can drift a little bit fore and aft uh, on these studs. It is not a positive fit thing and there are no locating dowels that always anchor it down in the same spot again. So the way I'm going to do that is just tap the crankshaft forward and then we'll tap it back. Do that a couple times. We'll end with it in the forward position. Let's see what we got. Yep, I can feel some end play. That feels pretty good. We can torque all these down now. The spec for these is 96 pound feet. There's that one. These are the last two. I've already done all the rest of them. There we are. Everything's tight. And that spins smooth. Passes the first test. Now we verify our bearing clearances. The first clearance I'm checking is crankshaft end play dial indicator set on the flange. The spec is 9 to 15 thousandths uh, desired clearance maximum permissible 20 thousandths. So we'll see what we have now. That looks like, yep, 9 thousandths. Perfect. Next clearance I want to verify is main bearing to crank journal clearance. And to do that, I've loosened all these main caps again, back them off a bit, and I'm going to use Plasti Gauge to check that measurement. I have some loaded in the rear main cap right now. I have the rest of these with Plasti Gauge in them already. They're just waiting to be tightened back down. So, one question I get quite a bit in the comment section is what is Plasti Gauge? Um, well, Experienced engine builders are probably gasping for breath right now because of the blasphemy that's currently on their screen. Um, a lot of, you know, the real professional guys, they would rather use inside mics and outside mics and cal calculate clearances and everything. Well, I'll tell you what, from the outside mic clearances I've already obtained on the journals on the crankshaft and considering that I have period correct from back in the day, new old stock Caterpillar brand main bearings, this plastic gauge is just kind of a formality, just to make sure everything is good. I'm already 90% sure that we're on the way there. This is just going to get me that last little 10%. So to explain plastic gauge, it is basically just extruded round strips of wax. That's all it is. Uh, it comes in, I have three different clearance ranges here. The green stuff will do one to three thousandths. The red stuff will measure two to six thousandths. And the blue will do four to nine thousandths. And if you are... Uh, more of a metric guy, metric person, metric is on the other side if that is more your flavor. So what you want to do is just cut off pieces of that wax. And what I do is uh, 
I hold them to the bearing shells with a little bit of grease, keeps them in place. And then when you tighten that bearing down, it is going to mash that wax out. It's going to make it wider. You then compare the graduations that are on the packaging to your now mashed out and widened out little pieces of wax and the graduation width that most closely matches the width you have on your bearing has a clearance uh, measurement that is assigned to it. That is a quick and easy way to determine what the clearances are inside bearings where you cannot get in there and measure. Torquing everything back to 96 pound feet again. To squash in that plastic gauge. And you don't want to spin the crankshaft while that stuff's in there. That's going to give you all kinds of erroneous readings. Another thing, uh, you do not want plastic gauge to be on the gravity side of your components. That means I put the plastic gauge under the rod caps because the crankshaft is basically laying on the shells that are in the block right now on the bottom half. So those lower shells are taking all of the weight of the crankshaft but the upper shells are where all the clearance would be because the crankshaft is going to sit down on the lower ones because of gravity the way the engine's positioned right now. So you will get the most accurate reading with plastic gauge on the upper caps because that's where the, your clearance is going to be right now. If I was plastic gauging connecting rods, I would not put the plastic gauge on the top under the cap. I would put the plastic gauge on the bottom, basically on the rod side bearing shell because when you're assembling a uh, rod cap to a rod, um, you get it started on there and as you tighten those nuts down, the cap generally is going to be hanging off of the top of the crank journal so you, and you're going to be drawing that rod up to it. So you want your plastic gauge on the bottom because the bottom of a rod is going to be where all your clearance is. I hope that makes sense. If it didn't, go back and listen to it again because I'm not sure I can explain it any better. <laughs> okay, we squashed the wax. Then I took all the main caps back off. I've got them lined up on the bench here and we will determine what the findings are. We'll just start with number one here and this GoPro is really not going to be very good for this. But get in here and I'll start checking. We have a, looks like a six thousandths. Six to borderline five on number one. I'll call it six. Number two, looking like we're running a six again. Number three, okay, we have number three is a five. Number four, we're looking like six. Number five, that one looks the tightest of all of them, really. Number five is a solid four. So, wrote them down here, running clearance mains. We got six, six, five, six, and four. Go to the specs once again. We have main bearing clearance Babbitt, three to five and a half with a maximum permissible of 12. So, three to five and a half desired brand new. We got five there, we got four, and we're running six on the other three. Guys, that's as close to brand new as you're going to get. Well, it looks like this crankshaft is going to be a definite go. I really like it. It fits well in the block, just like it should. Clearances are all within spec. And um, another thing I did off camera, I don't want to bore you guys too much. I put the dial indicator on this flange back here and checked for both axial and radial runout. Nothing detected at all. It spins nice and true. I then transferred it up here to the snout, checked for any kind of potential wobble. Again, nothing at all. The needle never even moves. So that eases my mind. A little bit more you know in the, in the area of this thing you know probably isn't sprung it probably isn't twisted the way it spins so smooth and every you know everything just turns just nice and true both ends I'm really really liking it, it makes me feel a lot better about uh, using it I'm not trying to just be overly meticulous for the camera or anything but I'm doing all these checks everything I can possibly think of right now because you know, we bought 1113 in a non-running state, and when you buy anything in a non-running state, you have no real idea as to why they truly parked it unless you were there when it happened. So with this old stuff, it's just, you know, I've seen too many things and I've been burned too many times to take anything for granted, and I would much rather find out if something is wrong with this piece now as opposed to after I have a fully assembled engine and it has some mystery vibration or I can't make it run smoothly and I don't know why. I'm just trying to catch anything that could possibly come back and bite me later down the line. 
So now that we know that it fits, I took it out. Not because I'm, well, I'm, I'm kind of crazy, but not because I'm crazy, but because it's going to make life so much easier for the next step. That is installing piston and rod assemblies. And because the bearings are so dang big on these things, they won't fit through the cylinder board. So your only option is to install them from the crankcase side. Now I could have installed them before I checked bearing clearances, but I could not have done the spin test on the crank with all those rods in there. And I wanted to be able to spin that and make sure I didn't have any tight spots, any excessive drag. So in my monkey brain, it made perfect sense to verify crank fitment first and then pull it back out only to install piston and rod assemblies. And then we'll pop that crank back in on top of it. And hopefully we'll get all that stuff finalized in the next episode. Uh, I'm going to wrap this one right here, though. I thank you for your patience. I thank you for watching. And let's get this face finished up next time, shall we? And we can finally move on to something else. Hope to see you back for that.